Well, today I want us to consider what we call the sovereignty of God in salvation. The sovereignty of God in salvation. Now, we've discussed a number of things that are to do with the, the antinomies, things that are to do with the doctrines of grace, the doctrine of reprobation, and many other things that deal with what we call uh, the sovereignty of God. However, today I also want us to look at different uh, subjects under the sovereignty of God. Uh, the first thing that I want uh, us to break down is what we call the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God simply means our God, that is the God of the Bible, He is Lord over everything and nothing happens apart from His direct action or indirect permission. He controls nature as well as nations. He controls humans as well as demons and nothing can stop his will. Now that is one big thing that we can basically consider under what we call the sovereignty of God. That our God is Lord over everything. Nothing happens apart from his direct action or indirect permission. He controls nature as well as nations, controls humans as well as demons, and nothing can thwart his will. In other words, nothing can stop his will. Now when it comes to salvation, salvation simply means the act of saving someone from sin. And verses about salvation, they appear in the Bible in a number of 166. 166 verses about salvation. Common scriptures that we've all known concerning the subject of uh, salvation, we can consider Romans 1.16 where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That is followed by also Romans chapter 10, and the verse is 10, which is also very clear. It says, For with the heart a man believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So these are all verses that talk about the same thing. Acts chapter 4, uh, 12, John chapter 4, verses uh, 22, etc, etc. Now, it's very important to understand that the word salvation comes from the Greek word that is known as soteria. Soteria, which means to rescue, which can also mean to deliver. So when we talk about the sovereignty of God in salvation, we are simply referring to God as the author of our salvation. Every time we talk about the sovereignty of God in salvation, we are simply referring to God as the author of our salvation. I know this is very much opposed to the common view which puts salvation in the hands of a fallen man to choose Christ first and then he is born again. That indeed shows a neglect of Christ's words that he made so very much clear even starting from the book of uh, the book of John a closer look on to John chapter 6 verses uh, 63 it says I'm using actually ESV version and King James it is the spirit who gives life the flesh is of no help at all the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life there you go Bible says the spirit gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. More other important thing that Jesus added in to say is actually when you consider John 6, 65, it says, and he said, fact, let me begin with 64. There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was would betray him 65 and he said this is why i told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted unto him by the father now those two verses explain a lot onto what we have at hand as far as the sovereignty of god in salvation that it is god who is the author of our salvation for jesus says this is why i told you no one can come to me and when he says no one that's a universal negative no one 
Now when it talks of the Khan, basically points to power, no any person has the power of himself to come unto Christ unless except meaning that particular essentials have to be met first before something else happens and so he says no one can come to me unless it is granted unto him by the father the father has to grant it when you roll back in john 6 44 he said the same thing he said that no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and i will raise him up on the last day now these are verses that are very common that any person that has studied the bible before any person that has read the bible before many of those individuals have come across these verses but what is very common people keep on passing them they never consider the context of these words why were these words phrased the way they were phrased why were they brought into the picture why do we have to consider them why is jesus making a double emphasis on to them he says in john 6 37 another thing which we need to consider 6 37 he says all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me i will never cast out so with verses are uh, uh, 44 63 65 these are just actually build ups on to what he had said much earlier so my dear ones considering also the words of the apostle paul you would basically understand from the very start that indeed god is sovereign in our salvation we don't bring ourselves to him it is him who first of all works in our hearts he transforms our hearts and then we are able to come to christ minus the, the help that we call the divine assistance that comes from our heavenly father no one can come to the son paul the apostle made it very clear when he said in, in ephesians 2 1 and you were dead in the trespasses and sins why is man not able to come to christ why is man not able to come to christ and to choose christ it is because man is dead in his sins and trespass dear ones dead men do not have faith to believe all they need is a spiritual regeneration and i'm saying it again dead men do not have faith to believe all they need is a spiritual regeneration man is not merely sick for a sick person can to some extent help himself but a dead person cannot contribute anything if it comes to his resurrection he cannot move his hand he cannot blink he cannot smell he cannot taste he cannot distinguish one man say that if you took a blind man into an art gallery and you told him you pick the best art work i'm willing to pay for it as long as you pick the one which is best for you that would be just a wastage of time the man is blind he cannot pick he cannot distinguish he cannot tell which is the best and which is actually the least think of this in the physical realm again what does a child contribute to his conception and birth you got it right i know nothing and that's the point here that i'm laboring to make there are also those who are still arguing from silence saying that of course man contributes something to his or her salvation and i want to admit and say that such people i agree there are many out there in numbers because they do not really have a sound knowledge about what happened to all of us in adam that the fall of adam affected our whole being that is our body soul mind emotions etc man is in a state which we call total depravity or which we might call total inability in the sense that nothing we can do nothing we can do is good enough to make us acceptable to god for all our disposition or our inclinations are all towards fulfilling the desires of our sinful flesh romans chapter 8 the verse is uh, 7 is so very much clear on that note it says that for the mind that is set on the flesh 
is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and the verses 14, it says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly unto him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This is the thing that, that we mean by the inability of man, by the depravedness of man, that man is not just sick, man is dead. A dead person contributes nothing to his resurrection. Think of Lazarus. What did he contribute to his resurrection in John chapter 11? And the same thing we are bringing back, that what does a child contribute to his conception and birth? Biblically, salvation and regeneration is monogistic in nature. When we talk about monogism, it is a theological term that means that salvation is the work or the act of God alone. The prefix mono means one or alone. And the word erogos stands for work. When you join them together, mono and erogos, and you put them together, you end up with what we call monogism, which is the belief that regeneration is the work of God alone because man is already dead in his sins and trespass. My dear ones, this is actually a hard pill to swallow, but it is the truth. Salvation is the work of God because a fallen man does not have faith in order to be born again. But man is born again by the spirit and the word and as a result he has faith. The scriptures are very much clear when you study from the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and the verse is 23. It says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and the abiding word of God. There you go. More to that, we can also consider 1 Peter 1 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, the key word is he has caused us. Now, the causality of our new birth has nothing to do with us. It is God. God is the causality of our new birth birth. That's why when you look in the book of James 1.18, it says of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Now, when it speaks of his will, the same thing that refers to what we are basically are laying here or unpacking. And that is the issue that is to do with God being sovereign in our salvation or actually what we are calling the sovereignty of God in salvation. It says of his own will, he brought us forth. Now, when you use a different version about this, if I may use a NKJV, it says of his own will he brought us forth that is nkjv but when you use king james says that of his own will he begat us with a word of truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures now that's the bible for you and this is the truth that none of us is able to escape away from when you look at the book of john chapter 3 when jesus was speaking to nicodemus in john 3 and verse 3 jesus answered him truly truly i say unto you unless one is born again doesn't say unless one has faith no it says unless one is born again that is to mean that it is the regeneration that precedes faith. Very important part. There are so many clear-cut examples even uh, from the Old Testament. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36 and the verses 26. This is what it says. I'll give you a new heart. Now, connect the pieces together from where we are coming from. It is God giving. It's not man changing himself, but it is God changing the heart of a sinner. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. I'll put within you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone. All unbelievers do have a heart of stone. That's why they cannot come to God of their own free will. God has 
to do a miracle that miracle is one big thing that happens without anything that is to do with the cooperation of man or without the participation of man i'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh 27 and i'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules it is him who causes it is him who worketh in us philippians also comes into play philippians chapter 2 and the verses 12 it says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is god who worketh in you both to will and to work his good pleasure this is why we are saying that god is sovereign in salvation it is him that is the author of our salvation and this just boils it down for us to say that god is sovereign in the matters of our salvation i want also to just bring in a something also still from the book of ezekiel now considering chapter chapter 37 beginning with verses 1 it says the hand of the lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit and he brought me out in the spirit of the lord and set me down in the middle of the valley it was full of bones verses 2 and he led me around among them and behold there were very many on the surface of the of the valley and behold they were very dry three and he said to me son of man can these bones live and i answered "O lord you know verses four then he said to me prophesy over these bones and say to them O dry bones hear the word of the lord five thus says the lord god to these bones behold i'll cause breath to enter you and you shall live the causality of life is not the bones but it is god who initiates who actually intervenes in with his divine assistance verse 6 and i'll lay snews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that i am the lord seven i prophesied as i was commanded and as i prophesied there was a sound and behold the rattling and the bones came together born to its bone eight and i looked and behold there were snews on them and the flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them nine then he said to me prophesy son of man and said to the breath thus says the lord god come from four winds or breath and breath on these slain that they may live but sustain so i prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army 11 this is to us it is an exceedingly great miracle then he said to me son of man these bones are the whole house of israel behold they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost we are indeed off we, we are indeed cut off to a law there are prophesied and said to them thus says the lord god behold i'll open your graves and raise you from your graves O oh, my people and i'll bring you into the land this is the same thing that happens at salvation that man being dead in his sins god raises him up he regenerates him by the power of his holy spirit john 3 verse 6 you remember what it says whatsoever that is born of flesh is flesh and whatsoever that is born of the spirit is spirit so the holy spirit regenerates all those that belong to god look at uh, the philippians chapter 1 the verses 20 for it has been granted to you for the sake of christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake so who grants the believing it's god who grants that believing that's why we are saying that god is sovereign in salvation so being born again the greek word is uh, actually anathon which means to be born from above which enables us to have faith in christ and this is the first act of god's grace and hence we become new creatures who do not hate god but love god why do we love god scripture is very clear a sinner 
chooses Christ because God chose him. This is why 1 John 4 19 says, We love because he first loved us. Now, the other thing that we need also to concretize more in the line, still in the line of monergism, is that uh, monergism is so much opposed to what we call synergism, which many people hold on to, but with little knowledge of what they affirm. When you talk about synergism, the prefix sign means with or together at the same time. And when we talk about also erogos, it means work. It's maintained the same way we have it on the other side of monergism because this side we are talking about synergism. So uh, erogos, the same thing that points to work in monergism and actually also synergism. The only difference is that in monergism, salvation is an act of God. But when it comes to synergism, it is basically asking the divine and human cooperation where God and man work together to bring about one is conversion. To be sure, with synergism, man does his part and God does his part in the initiation of faith. At this point, I want to chip in what Luther said. Luther, Martin Luther said that synergism is a works best salvation. Now, why is that one so? Because man has to do something. This robs God of his glory. When you talk about man doing his part and also God doing his part, remember from where we came from, that man is dead in his sin. And if man is dead in his sin, he cannot respond to the things of God. He cannot desire the things of God. His choosing, his choice is always in the area of his greatest desire or his greatest inclination. And that is actually to fulfill the desires of the sinful flesh. Now, the subject of money's will being in bondage and being unable to choose God because it's only inclined to sinful desires until God does a miracle of his divine initiative to give grace to man to believe and those that believe are his elect this is so much resisted by almost all men in the world why is this so what has to be made clear here is that all men are not as good as they think they are it's only god who can free us God is saving grace is completely unmelted and he extends it only to those whom he predestines to salvation. Now here is where I want to get into a number of the things that really put the strongest <laughs> nail in the coffin because I've not yet, uh, I, I, I'm not yet resting my case but uh, these are the verses that indeed drive the point home. I want to just begin by considering, or you yourself considering with me, uh, Romans chapter 9, beginning with verses uh, 10. It says, And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, follow the story, verses 11, Though they were not yet born, and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. So, the thing that we cannot all miss to have our attention on to are the words in verses 11. For children being yet, for children being not yet born, neither having done anything good or evil. Look at that. This is sovereign selection. That the purpose, prothesis, which is the same thing as uh, to mean the setting forth, that the purpose of God according, according to election. What is the election about? Election actually comes from a Greek word that is known as ekelogomai. Now, election simply means from the Greek language, what we can basically call sovereign selection. It can also refer to what we call the act of picking out. The act of God's free will by which before the foundation of the world, he decreed his blessings to certain persons. Election means the act of God's free will by which before the foundation of the world, he decreed his blessings to certain persons. That, that's the thing. And uh, more to that, we can still say that election is the decree made from choice by which he determined to bless certain persons through Christ by grace alone. By grace alone. So, 
it has to do with God electing his people. But the Bible says this election of these individuals was made before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. And the, the other thing that we also have to be very clear about here, it says that, that according to the election might stand a not of works, but of him that calleth him kaleo kaleo which is the word that means to actually to call out to invite and it can also mean to name these are actually words that are inspired that we can never go wrong about we talk about the servant of god in salvation this is what we mean there are people that God has sovereignly elected of his own free will by which before the foundation of the world he decreed his blessings upon them. He made a decree of his own choice by which he determined to bless those particular individuals in Christ by grace alone no wonder ephesians 1 verses 4 comes into play when it says that uh, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him he predestined us he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now, when we pick again from uh, verses 11 where we left off in Romans 9, it says in verses 12, it was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger, 13. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Every word here, it is literal. There is nothing figurative here. There is nothing like any sort of an hyperbole. They are all literal words. Verses 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. When you see Paul by the Spirit bringing in this anticipation, just know you are being answered. It was anticipated that a question would arrive. But we are talking about a sovereign God who does what he chooses to do and is not obligated to any person he does not consult any man he is not getting any counsel from any man verses 15 says for he saith unto moses that is exodus 33 i'll have mercy on whom i'll have mercy and i'll have compassion on whom i'll have compassion verse 16 so then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth but of god that showeth mercy i want also to bring in john chapter 6 which we covered much earlier but it's very important for us also to bring it back here in john 6 37 it says all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out now also considering second timothy chapter 2 and verses 10 the words of the apostle paul bible says that therefore i endure all things for the Electis sake for the electis sake which is the greek word here that is known as echelotos the ones that were picked out chosen uh, by god to obtain salvation through jesus christ and uh, which we can still understand as uh, a choice or select that was made by god bible says i endure all things for the electis sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in christ jesus with eternal glory. How about also Psalms 110? Psalms 110. These are verses that people pass by every day. Now, I know much of what I've communicated will not be received with a lot of joy to those that uh, do not subscribe to the sufficiency of the scripture, to the inherence of the scripture, to the infallibility of the scripture. I know these will not be received well by those who believe in synergism, that man does something and God does something. But look at this verse here, Psalms 110 verse 3. It says, your people, your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. 
that when it comes to those individuals, God sovereignly elected and he made his own before anything was as far as us talking about the eternal decrees. The effectual calling of God or what we call the irresistible grace of God when it is extended to those individuals that belong to the Lord. They that were formerly unwilling are made willing and they will come. This is what we see in Psalms 110 the verse 3. So there are several things that we can actually say about this particular subject that is to do with the sovereignty of God in salvation. My intention in doing this is to call down the jets of those men and women out there who see themselves now in Christ and they think they were very clever as compared to their neighbors who are not yet in Christ or who died outside Christ, who think that they helped themselves as far as the subject of salvation is concerned, that they had to pick God, and because they, they elected God, they chose God, therefore God also had to choose them. That's not the Bible that we are reading from. The Bible is very clear, even from John 15, 16, I chose you, you never chose me. A dead person cannot choose. A dead person needs divine assistance. The words are very clear in Ephesians 2, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind but look at verses 4 but God but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, we didn't love him, but he loved us. We love him now because it is him who loved us first. Verse 6, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Look at that verse 5. Even when we were dead, in your dead situation, you could not choose. You've seen people dead. Maybe in your families or in, in some other places. Have you seen a person who is dead actually being able to help himself? No. We are talking about now the spiritual death. That a man who is spiritually dead. We can just compare him to a person who is physically also dead. That the same way person when he's physically dead cannot help himself. Spiritually it is the same thing. We are blind. We are deaf. We were hopeless. We are weak. We had no strength in us. Bible says in that situation of our deadness, even when we are dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The Bible uses the word that is to do with a spiritual resurrection and raised us up with him, raised us up with him. In fact, Romans also concretizes on the same subject. In Romans chapter 5, the verse is... Uh, Eight. Finally, we begin with six. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Look at verses eight. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is complete monarchism. God Himself intervening in our impossible situation. God working out a miracle. It's why we have said that the outstanding miracle of all miracles is the miracle of salvation. Dead person, dead in trespasses and sins, being made alive, it's the work of God alone. And so, my dear ones, I want also to chip in some few things here as far as the common objections to what I've just discussed as far as the issue of the sovereignty of God in salvation and also election because there are many questions that come from a number of individuals who actually need some things to be made so very much clear to them just like all of us in the past before we came to the knowledge of this truth God himself is the one who had to help us and it's him that will help them to understand this because 
this is not something where you just say no i have to just understand it no you need to see it there and that seeing it there it has to be the work of the Spirit of God and Him giving you the clear understanding of that which is written. So there are many people who run to First Timothy chapter 2 as their objection to uh, the sovereignty of God in salvation and election. They say, how about First Timothy 2, 4? Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Who desires all? So they say, how about that verse? But the thing here that is very important is what we have said in several other teachings of ours. Context, context, context is key. That there is no any verse that can deny its context. The moment you rip a verse out of its context, you are going to end up with what we call in suggestions. You putting your mind into the scriptures. And then the other thing that you are going to end up with is you teaching your own ideas you teaching your own ideas. So looking again in context, First Timothy chapter 2 beginning with verses 1, it says, First of all, then I urge you that supplication and prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people. Now that's how it starts. That supplication, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people. What is the apostle meaning? Verses 2 explains, for kings and all who are in high positions. Now, when it speaks of all people, it is basically pointing to all kinds of different individuals under different, actually, vocations. All people can mean all those that are kings, all those that are lawyers, all those that are competitors, all those that are doctors, all those that are farmers, all those that are barbarians, all those that are this and all that. So... When the scripture says in verses for who desires all people, so remember where we talked about the sovereign selection. God's people are actually scattered in different vocations and they are being defined by different things. Some are slaves, some are masters, some are kings, some are lawyers, some are doctors and all of that. So it doesn't basically mean when it says that who desires all people for us to think that this verse is universal in the sense that each and every person shall be saved. No, from what we have seen, there are particular individuals in Romans chapter 9 that the Lord has decided of his own will to actually, and he has decreed to share his blessings with them through Christ by grace alone. So, First Timothy chapter 2 verses 4 you need to just get it in two contexts. That's why, again, in verses 5, it says, For there is one mediator, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man. So which men? Not each and every man, but the men that belong to him, the people that belong to him. And those people that were given unto him is why verse 6 says that, Who gave himself a ransom for all? All who go back to John chapter 6 where we came from, all there is very clear in John chapter 6 and verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. So that all here talks about the elect, those that are known as God is elect, that he gave to his son. They are scattered in different nations, scattered in different vocations, but all of them, wherever they are, the sacrifice of Christ would be sufficient and would be actually actual for them, be actual and particular and definite and limited actually for them alone. Now, the other objection that people normally pick up with is the same thing that uh, the, the, it's somehow common with what we've just considered. Uh, that is First John. First John chapter 2. Now, we need to understand simple Bible hermeneutics, methods interpreting the scriptures. Very important before we do the exegesis. We need to understand who is writing and is writing to. This is John, a Jew, writing to who? To the Christian Jews. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Talking to believers. Now look at verses 2. He is also the appeasing sacrifice or the propitiation for our sins. Who? The ones that are believers that are known as the Jews. And then he adds in to say, not for ours only. Only. If he said that, not for ours only. Not to the Jews only. 
is what is meaning but also for the sins of the whole world the sins of the whole world the whole world in context refers to the gentiles that are also among god's elect why do we say what we say you need to cross examine again that when you look at the book of uh, john chapter 17 you cannot miss verses 9 which says I am praying this is the priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let me begin verse 8. For I have given them the words which you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you you sent me. Verse 9. I am praying for them now that them are who the ones that were given to the Lord. Bible as in to say, I am not praying for the world, for the world, but for those whom you have given me for they are yours and all mine are yours and yours are mine and i am glorified in them so here you have it also very much clear for you to take that when we talk about the world we should never in the scriptures always generalize it to mean that this is a universal atonement for each and every person no you need to understand it is the context that will give a meaning to that which you do not understand that is why i told you earlier that there is no any verse that can deny its context and the best commentary for the bible is the bible itself so if one verse appears to be very difficult for you there are other verses that are not obscure the other verses that are more clear that will help you to have you actually have all the pieces aligning well for you so very important for us to understand that our first john chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 is simply means when it speaks of a unknown for us only unknown for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world john is simply pointing to the rest of the gentiles that are part of Christ's sheep which we also still see from the same writer in john chapter 10 John chapter 10 the verse 16 let me begin with verse 15 for just as the father knows me i know the father and i lay down my life for the sheep now you need to understand when jesus is speaking of the sheep he's speaking about who he's speaking about the elect verse 16 and i have other sheep that are not of this fold speaking of who of the gentiles because his ministry was limited to the jews only and the jews always had it like that that salvation belong to them alone but the lord himself makes it very clear by saying and i have other sheep that are not of this fold they are not among their jews i must bring them also and they will listen to my voice there so there will be one flock one shepherd this is the clarity of it all my dear ones now i want to go to the third objection that is also very clear, uh, common today Why are people chipping John chapter 3 and verses 16? But the challenge that I've seen that is very common when people walk run to John 3:16 is that they actually take John chapter 3 verse 16 out of its context and they do not actually connect it with the rest of the verses that come before it. But what you do have in John 3:16, it is a build up of that which the Lord started on when he was speaking with who with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus being a Jew, Jesus himself being a Jew, he speaks to that fellow Jew by saying, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life." So now, the ones that belong to Arminianism with their view also of synergism that God does something and man also does something. They say now here the verses talking of the general salvation of each and every person that what would put a person out is when they don't believe but remember when the lord was speaking to nicodemus he made it very clear verses 5 of john 3 jesus answered truly truly i say to you unless one is born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter now that is the spirit and the word they don't forget so in many cases it's always actually referred to is also pictured by water Bible as in to say he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But now again look at this one again in verses 8. The wind blows where it wishes. That is the Holy Spirit in picture here that they're talking about because the everything is about the spirit, the spiritual regeneration. You hear its sound 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. Everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, the ones who believe here, the whosoever here that believe, they believe because they have been regenerated. And the word in context here, it is the word of the elect. The believing ones are the ones that will inherit eternal life. So, John chapter 316, Jesus himself being a Jew speaking to a Jewish man that is known as Nicodemus, Jesus makes this statement, and this statement was made in opposition to the Jewish notion that salvation belonged to the Jews only. So, but this statement, it can be made so very much clear in the sense that the Lord Jesus was saying, but I tell you, God has loved the Jews as well as the Gentiles. So, the Jews who are a part of God's elect and the Gentiles that are a part of God's elect, they make the world that is being referred to here. Now, I want also to chip in the common one also that follows after John 3.16, which, which has become a popular verse for the universal teaching, is when people go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9. But before they go to 2 Peter 3, 9, which says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Though some manuscript actually add in and say, is patient on your account, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So people say, there you go. Have you seen the verse? That verse is very clear. God is actually patient, not wanting any person to perish. And that is to mean, in the mind of the Armenian, is that uh, here when a person gets lost, when a person perishes, is because that person did not exercise, did not do his part. Because they believe that much as the sin of Adam affected man, but it didn't affect man so, so much in that man cannot make a decision of coming to Christ. But my dear ones, we need to understand that people Peter was writing to. Why do we say what we say? Because it's very important to understand who the writer is, who is he writing to, and then we need to understand what was the message about, what was the reason for his writing. But now, look at how he starts the letter. He starts by saying, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you in the knowledge of God and of the Father. So now, mark that. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with us. Those are none other but what? The elect. Go back to First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, and see how he also starts it. He starts in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He says that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, to those who are elect, exiles of dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied. So, we know who is writing, and the people is writing to. First of all, he's a Jew. He's writing to the fellow Jews who are scattered. At the same time, he's writing to, to the fellow elect, who are actually scattered, who are in a dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So, by the time we come to the second letter, we know already the people that he's addressing. These are the elect because, again, we also see from uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, when you try to follow through, in 2 Peter 1, it says, Therefore, brothers, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. So the thing is that there's a particular group of individuals that the apostle is actually addressing. So by the time he comes in chapter 3, and verses 9, and then he says what he says. You need to have followed the flow of the writer. The flow of the writer. Even in chapter 3, verses 1, he says, This now is the second letter I am writing to you. Who? The elect in dispersion. Beloved, beloved, look at that. Not the unbelievers. Unbelievers are not God's beloved. But those that the Father chose in the Son. 
say that, Beloved, in both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by the hope of reminder that you should remember the prediction of the prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. You get that? So now, by the time we come in 3.9, and it says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. It's important, my dear ones, to understand that Peter was simply talking about the elect, the elect of God. When you read in context, because there is no any verse which can deny its context, you'll be able to realize and know, understand the kind of people Peter was writing to, which is also made so very much clear. When you see that these people are the same that again we discussed in other verses, but also looking at these people, they come from different places. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9, it says, And after this I looked, behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation. Now I hear it, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne, before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, which is the same thing that we again see in chapter 5, the verse is still 9, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, nation. So, in each and every nation, in each and every language, in each and every tribe, in each where you find a group of people, God has his people and uh, his patient, not willing that any of them should perish. So the elect will not be lost. So that's why we talk about the sovereignty of God in salvation and in and election. So the late Aracis Pro say that Jesus and the rest of the New Testament writers used the word all men, comma, whole world to correct the Jews that Jesus' sacrifice was not limited only to the Jews. That's what the late Aracis Prol made a comment about this particular thing of generalization. Generalization. It was pointing to a particular group of individuals in different contexts. So, Jesus died for Jews and Gentiles alike, but particularly those who were given to him by his father but not him dying for every single person. Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, actually those two verses are also very clear when they point to many, proving a point that Jesus died for some. That is why the context consists the word many. So these many people, a collection of those from different nations, uh, people, languages and tribe and tongues that what we have already seen i want to end with also a statement that was made by the late j.i parker he said that uh, on court election is a family secret of the children of god we do not know who else he has chosen among those who do not yet believe nor why it was his good pleasure to choose us in particular what we do know First, that had we not been chosen for life, we would not be believers now. For only the elect are brought to faith. And uh, I want to conclude with some two important verses here. One is Romans chapter 9, and the verse is 21. It says that has the porter no right over the clay to make out of some lamp one vessel for honorable use, and another for dishonorable use. 22. What if God desiring to show his wrath, to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Verses 24. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Those are God's elect. And God has all the right to do whatsoever he wills to do, whatsoever he chooses to do. The ones who go to hell, 
they have nothing to complain about for the wages of sin is death and the ones who go to heaven they have nothing to brag about what they have just seen is god's mercy which they didn't deserve that's why it's mercy and mercy cannot be demanded and the ones who go to hell what they experience is god's justice because as a righteous god he cannot leave sin to go minus it being punished for all men have sinned and fallen short of god's glory so the ones that are saved and the ones that he chose to, to, to show his grace they simply see and experience his mercy and those that are, that are thrown into the lake Ah, they are actually thrown there. Them actually experiencing the justice of God. God is responsible for our salvation, but is not responsible for our damnation. That's why the gospel is preached unto all men. Unto all men. We don't know who is elected, and we do not know who that is not elected. So why would you have to say to yourself that ah, no, me, 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 I don't believe. Probably I'm not an elect. And uh, to us, the Bible is very clear that the message has to go to each and every person because. We have just seen J.I. Parker saying that this is a family secret. And so when you consider Matthew 20 verses 15, uh, it also brings in something for us to consider as the Lord Jesus was employing different laborers in his vineyard and as he was teaching us something. Now let us begin with eight years to understand. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to, to his former man, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first that is up nine and when those hired about the eleventh hour came each of them received a denarius versus which they had agreed versus ten now when those hired first came they thought they would receive more but each of them also received a denarius and on receiving it they grumbled at the master of the house versus uh, twelve saying these last worked one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat 13 but he replied to one of them friend am i doing you wrong did you not agree with me for a denarius take what belongs to you and go i chose to give to this last worker as i give to you look at 15 am i not allowed to do what i choose with what belongs to me or do you begrudge my generosity so that's the thing there is nothing we can actually say. That's unfair. We don't need. That's not a word that should come from dead sinners, rebels. It shouldn't come from us. We don't deserve anything good for all that we have sinned against our heavenly Father. So if He has decided to show mercy to some, who are we to complain? So as the porter, He has the freedom to do what He chooses to do. And so, and all He does, He does in righteousness. There is nothing like any hill thing that God has against particular individuals. No, he's the one who created all of us. And all men have always seen his common grace. The rain, the sunshine, plants growing and all of this and all of that. So this is something for us to think about and to prayerfully consider what actually we might be believing that does not agree with that which is already written for us to go back to the Bible teaching. So any of us that is born again, all the honor and the glory goes back to God. And to you that is not yet saved, I urge you to believe unto the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That is not for you to answer that, are you elected or not? You believe the gospel. Remember, you are a sinner. Do not harden your heart. Shalom. Yeah, the Bible says I was head in my sinful ways. And Ephesians 2 tells me it's by grace through faith I'm saved. See, the Lord chose to save you from sins in which you once walked. And that was not your doing, salvation's the gift of God.
fallen You were just a slave to that Yeah, the Bible, it tells me God hardens whomever he wills No, it's not about you and your justice-defining skills Yeah, I'm holding these two lips and I go Check out these flowers You know that you want this bouquet Whoa. Because you know it's all about His grace About His grace and